Thank you very much, uh, Janice, for the introduction. And I'm going to have to, yeah. So thank you very much for everybody for turning up. Um, I'm delighted to be here uh, and talk to you about some research that we've conducted over the last three or four years uh, on preventing uh, poverty and social exclusion for those affected by autism. Um, First of all, uh, well, actually, first of all, the team, uh, Lynn, Dr. Lynn uh, McCair and Dr. Julianne Jordan uh, were working with me on this. They can't be here today because they're already involved in the next, next projects. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about is just briefly what is autism, although Janet has already uh, outlined that, so I'll be very, very brief about that. How does autism increase the vulnerability uh, to poverty and exclusion? And then I'm going to talk to you about the four phases of the BASE project that we conducted. We called it benchmarking autism efficiency, efficiency as, a, as, a, as a working title, so that's uh, that always nice to have some nice acronyms. And then we're going to look at uh, recommendations out of the poverty trap into inclusion. Um, so what is autism? As Janet was saying, it's a pervasive uh, developmental disability. Uh, d the term lifelong, we can debate that at, at length, whether it's lifelong or whether there are actually, uh, because there are increasingly uh, methods to maybe uh, question that assumption. But it, it is basically based on pervasive difficulties in social communication, restricted and repetitive behaviours and varying levels of support. Um, common core occurring conditions are intellectual disability, mental health issues and physical health issues. Um, the estimated prevalence, as Janice ha has already said, uh, in Northern Ireland we have 2.3% of the children in, in the schools. I want to show you a little video just to put us all on the, on the same page because, because autism is such a spectrum that uh, very often people are sort of saying, well, there's, there are people very high functioning, uh, uh, that, that actually would argue that autism is actually a, a gift and that, that we should cherish people for that gift. Now, obviously, we should cherish everybody, regardless where on the, con on, the, on the spectrum they fall. But I think it's important to remember that for many, many people with autism, it's actually uh, causing a lot of uh, issues with them. So I'm going to show you just a very brief video just to remind us what also autism actually looks like for most. I think, I think that last uh, quote, I, I, I think this is very, very true for most parents. Uh, you know, they, they, uh, they feel like they've been drafted into this. They, of course, they love their child and they want to do the best for their child. So for, in terms of the, the research that we were conducting, we started off with the UN Convention for the Rights of People with Disabilities, just to see uh, all the, to, to cover all the different issues. Um, and you can see it covers a range of different issues. And we will, we will talk them through as we go along with the, with the research. The BASE project had four phases. The first phase was a literature review, and the literature review had two aspects to it. At one, we were reviewing the literature that was available uh, in internationally. We focused on autism, intellectual disability, and poverty, uh, and education and employment, because these, the, the project was all focusing on those issues, so that was important for us to look at the literature regarding that. But we also looked at all the policies, because up to the uh, task group uh, in, of autism report in 2002, um, there had been so many reports and so many policies. We found about 70 uh, different policies from different departments, so it was so important to look at all of those and to see whether there were commonalities um, in them. But I, I will talk to you about the, the data in a minute, but I'll just talk you through the, the structure of the project. In uh, phase two, we did a, a, a NILS, Northern Ireland Life and Times, autism module. The, the, the survey, Northern Ireland uh, Life and Times survey, happens every year, and people can buy a module as such. So there's a questionnaire, go, uh, people go now to interview people from the population, uh, scientifically selected sample of the Northern Irish population, and nobody had ever asked them about autism. There was one question in a disability uh, module some, some years ago, but this was the first time that it was a full module just focusing in on autism. And the question was really, we wanted a quantitative baseline uh, of, of, of the data for awareness because at that time, people were, a lot of people were saying we need awareness raising, but nobody had actually set, uh, assessed the awareness that was already in the country. So we, needed to see, we wanted to see how much, money, or how much uh, money should be spent on awareness raising campaign, how much, where should be the focus for the awareness raising campaign. There were 1,200, just over 1,200 people took part in that survey. 
The third phase was a secondary data analysis. We looked at all the data sets that were available in the country um, that, that we could find uh, anything to do with autism in the data set. So a secondary data analysis basically means you're using other people's data that are publicly available and you analyze them and in our case we uh, basically split the sample you know has autism has not autism and then we compared the two two sides of the um, of the of the sample uh, we focused on again on disability and poverty employment education there were a whole range at first we were told oh, there won't be enough data sets for you to do a secondary data analysis but as it turned out there were actually quite a few data sets where under the disability question the, the people had been asked you know, do you have a disability? And then autism came up, so we were able to, to, to use the data. And the, finally, the fourth phase was a qualitative data analysis. So what we did, we did focus groups, interviews, questionnaires uh, with stakeholders. We had nearly 800 uh, professionals taking part and 41 service users taking part. So we had individuals with autism, their caregivers, we had employers, educators, health and social care staff, and policy makers. So it was a wide, wide ranging. So that was the, the whole, uh, the methodology of the, of the base project. All the reports are available on, online, so if you, you're very welcome to, to read the reports in detail. So let's have a look at the key findings, okay? So we, we, we went around the, the United Nations Convention for the, for the Rights of People with Disability in terms of the topics that we selected for the, for the analysis. Uh, we found in, in diagnosis and uh, special educational needs assessment that about 200 new referrals per month in Northern Ireland, um, about half of them are getting a diagnosis and half of them are put on a waiting list or are not diagnosed. So having people coming, coming up on a waiting list at 100 per people per month has built up a waiting list of about 3,000 children on the waiting list at the time when we did the research. And that, as you can imagine, that list grows by 100 people every month. So, uh, that of course, there will be a number of people that are not going to get a diagnosis and they're they not going to be counted in that. But um, so, so people have to wait uh, much, much longer than, than we would have hoped, oftentimes over two years before they actually get a diagnosis. And we also know that people are actually presenting for a diagnosis. They already, you know, much after they already know that there's something, they're, they're worried about their child. So usually parents start worrying about their child and it takes them a full year before they present for diagnosis. And then it takes two years to get a diagnosis. And then it takes another long time to get a, a, a special educational needs statement. Nearly 60% of the kids don't get their special educational needs statement within the 26 weeks. And 76 is, weeks is a half a year already. So they're waiting even longer than half a year. Um, and most of the kids that are diagnosed with autism are diagnosed at the, at the, at the, uh, with a special educational needs at, a, at quite a severe uh, level of need. The rising prevalence rate, Janet has already mentioned that uh, over the years, I've just put it on the, on the graph there, that you can see that every year when the figures come out in Northern Ireland, the prevalence rates are rising. So you have, uh, at the moment, the, the numbers are uh, 23%. Um, but we did a, a secondary data analysis of the Millennium Cohort Study where 18,000 families who had a child in the year 2000 are interviewed every two years by, uh, uh, I think it's the London School of Economics or the uh, uh, the University College London, I can't remember, they conduct this, this uh, Millennium Cohort study and they are interviewing these people. So these data are freely available for researchers to analyse. And what we did, we split the sample into the people that said that their child has autism versus the people that said their child didn't. So yes, no split. Quite a simplistic statistics. There are people that could make more complicated statistics, but we started off using the entire sample. At, the, at, five years, or, yeah, at five years of age was the first time that these people had been asked, does your child have autism? Uh, we have the numbers here, 0.9% uh, of them said yes. That was out of 15,000 families. At seven years of age, 1.7% of the people said that their child had autism. And of course, the numbers go slightly down because a few people drop off the study. But uh, at age 11, that was in 2011. Remember, the kids were born in the year 2000. 3.5% of the parents, and that's out of 13,000 families in, in, the, in the whole of the UK. And we did the statistics to make sure that this was representative of Northern Ireland as well. So I think our, our figure of 2.3 could very well be still quite a vast underestimation of the number of kids that actually have autism. Um, 
in terms of the awareness, we, we did the adult survey in, for the NILs that I've just described in phase two, but we also did two other surveys that are not funded by the same grant, but I think there is still interesting data here to compare. We did a survey of 11-year-olds and a survey of 16-year-olds, uh, and we looked at autism awareness. So out of the 11-year-olds, 50% said that they knew what autism was. Uh, with the older ones, it was 80%, and with the adults, it was 82%. So people know what autism is. When you just ask them, do you know what autism is? Of course, that doesn't mean to say that they really know it. So we also asked them, uh, do you know anybody with autism? Do you know somebody with autism? And the kids, the younger ones, about 43%. But when you look at the 16-year-olds, the nearly three-quarters of the 16-year-old actually knew somebody with autism, most likely a schoolmate or a relative. Uh, half the adults knew somebody, just over half the adults. Uh, when we asked them, do you have autism? Do you, you know, do you know somebody like myself? The kids were saying, the younger ones were saying, 2.7% of them were saying that they had autism. The older children, 3.1%. Now with the adults, we only got 0.01%. I think there was only one of the adults that actually said that, uh, that they had autism themselves. So that's probably not a, a true reflection. But with the kids, I thought it was very interesting that those figures are actually quite close to the Millennium Cohort Study figures. Uh, that, that in 2016, six, the, they would have been 16-year-olds, right? Now, we haven't got the Millennium Cohort Study data yet for this age group because obviously that takes a wee while before the data become public. When we asked them about the knowledge of autism, again, we came up with uh, that their knowledge was actually quite good. Uh, I mean, you know, the data are there to, to, I mean, the good doesn't tell you anything, but when we asked them, they had it fairly much spot on what, what you'd expect them to know. And the attitude towards autism, things like, uh, you know, how would you feel if a child with autism enters into your class, comes into your class, or becomes a neighbour, or so forth? They were, generally speaking, they were very, very positive. Um, so we'll have conclusions from that in a minute. Staff training. When we when we looked at the uh, phase four, where we actually asked the staff, how much training do you have? We were really quite shocked. We had nearly 800 <laughs> professionals. And they were basically, the ones that had got training, there was a lot of them had not ex gotten any extra training. And we know from basic uh, qualifying training that even in speech and language therapy, teachers, social workers, and so forth, they don't get a lot of training in qualifying training uh, in autism. So they come in qualified professionals with... Sound a bit bad. Qualified professionals with very little training to start with, and then their post-qualifying training. Uh, most of them had level one, which is one or two hours. Okay, basically that's that's a lecture of one or two hours. That's like you leaving here uh, after this lecture today, saying you know if, you, if you're listening to one or two hours of a mountaineer saying about mountain climbing, would you go, would you think you're qualified to climb a mountain? Obviously not, right? So the training that these people receive after qualifying is very very minimal. And uh, as Janet was describing what's in the autism strategy, uh, the local university training is not in the autism strategy or, or in the action plan. And obviously that's uh, been in our bonnets for, for being uh, university academics because the local universities offer a vast variety of autism training. And for that to be completely ignored is, uh, is quite scandalous, I think, personally. In Queens, we have a master's in autism spectrum disorders. We have two masters in applied behavior analysis, one in Queens and one in Ulster. And we have pre and, uh, pre and undergraduate level courses in all three universities. And we have, of course, PhD training on, on the universities as well, which focus on autism. So we have a lot of autism training in the universities. It doesn't appear in the autism strategy. It doesn't appear in the autism ac action plan. And that's a big gap, I think. That's a, it's a resource that belongs to the department that's completely underutilized. So when it comes to, to poverty and inequality, the estimated cost of a lifetime, over a lifetime in autism is between one to one and a half million pounds. Uh, that's research that we found in the literature review. We didn't do, collect those data ourselves, that's in the literature. The total cost of autism in the UK is 34 billion uh, pounds. So autism is an expensive thing for the, for the country. Um, now, the, the interesting thing that we thought was the cost of care for adults is much greater in the UK than it is for children, but it's the opposite way around in the States. So it seems to be, I mean, we're not going to talk about the politics of the States here, but at the moment it seems to be that the USA are investing, in the, in the, really investing early in the children so that they can then save later. So it's an invest to save kind of policy. Um, the cost of bringing up a child with autism uh, is three to six times more expensive than bringing up other children. So, uh, just um, in the States, there are 45 uh, 
states have now uh, legislation to fund through, through their health system, fund autism interventions that are evidence-based, that are based on applied behaviour analysis, but we'll hear about, more about that later on. Um, in uh, Northern Ireland, uh, early intervention is brief and patchy. Usually early intervention uh, equates to one visit, maybe one to three hour visits. That's, that's commissioned out to some of the charities to, to con conduct those. People are given leaflets and, and that's, that's called early intervention. To me, that's a visit. And I'm not saying that's, that's not needed. That's probably a really interesting visit. But I've had students in my class who, one student had five children with autism. She's had that visit five times. Now, she could tell them way more about autism than, than she needs to hear, okay? So, um, and she was sort of saying, you know, they come, in, they come in for their visit and they tell me what autism is as if, she, as if I didn't know. Um, at the moment, parents rely on a small voluntary organization that does not receive. To get, to get applied behavior analysis-based intervention, their, their parents have to rely on a small voluntary organization that does not receive any government support. So uh, educational outcomes, not surprisingly, children with autism miss school a lot more than other children, 13 days more per year, and other children average about two, two weeks or 10 days, so it can be up to five weeks per year that these children miss school. They're frequently excluded and they're frequently bullied. They have lower educational attainment uh, when it comes to GCSE results and so forth. Unemployment, so we'll be working our way up in, in terms of the age, unemployment and deprivation. Adults with autism have very low employment rates, we know that. Now these figures come from England, we don't have the Northern Irish figures on unemployment. Uh, many parents, and I think this is a crucial thing, many parents give up employment to care for their child, and if it's a two-parent family that are work, where both parents are working, then one of the parents gives up work. So when it comes to, to poverty, here we have two wages coming into the family. Child with autism is born, one of the wages is already stopped, uh, and the costs are higher. So it's only natural that, the, that there should be a, a, a real concern about poverty. So what, what we, I've drawn the little scales here just to show you that really, we are, uh, when you think of poverty and inequality, there's high cost of autism, late diagnosis, lack of staff training, lack of early intervention, social exclusion and unemployment on that side. And on the other side, we have fairly good public avail awareness. We are not doing too badly there. And when it comes to post and sec secondary education, we're actually not doing too badly when we did the secondary data analysis of people coming through to universities to study as, as students. We're actually getting a fairly reason good, good percentage of kids coming through to become students at universities, which is good. Um, we haven't got the finishing data yet because the data taking has only started about two years ago. So we don't know if these kids come in as students, young, young people come in as students, and do they actually complete their courses. What we do know is very often that the level of courses that they undertake in further education are much more basic, sort of like the essential skills kind of courses rather than high level uh, academics. So what are we recommending? We are recommending that autism awareness is quite high that therefore we don't really need a general autism awareness campaign because we already have Light Up Blue by Autism Speaks. We know that the, even the City Hall in Belfast is lighting up blue every year, which is fantastic, on the 2nd of April. Different charities and bodies have their autism awareness month events uh, quite across uh, picking up on that, so that's great. Um, we have uh, understanding autism courses by statutory as well as voluntary sector, so we have a lot of autism awareness in Northern Ireland, maybe more than in other countries. Um, so we don't need a, a t there was a talk about a TV advertisement campaign, and I think apart from that being entirely controversial, we don't actually need it. We've got fairly good awareness. We still have to keep an eye on it. We don't want it to drop, and 80% is not 100%, right? But we're not doing too badly. But we found that some of the frontline medical and justice staff could do with extra training. Sometimes doctors don't even know really where to go with autism. When it comes to staff training, uh, we should do a cost savings analysis when it comes to staff training because at the moment an awful lot of money is spent on staff training that maybe could be spent better. Uh, we, at the moment we're not engaging with, the, well I say not we, but at the moment the, the higher education sector is not engaged with properly when we're doing so much autism training, we do workshops, we do undergraduate, postgraduate training, there should be an active engagement with higher education sector and autism research as well. It's actually quite interesting when I'm talking about this research, um, I've actually been attacked about the quality of this research, which I think is, is, is pretty much, you know, we've published many, many peer-reviewed papers from this research, and yet I got a letter, from my VC got a letter in that this was rubbish research. So when we are internally attacked for our research, then it's definitely not being valued. 
Um, diagnosis and assessment, we should stop this watch and wait approach. At the moment we have a, a watch and wait approach where people are watching and waiting. Maybe the kid will grow out of it. Children do not grow out of autism. Right? Now with very good early intervention, and we'll hear a little bit more about that, with very good early intervention, the prospects to optimal outcomes are significantly increased. We know that from the research. So why are we not doing that? Why are we not giving those kids the best that, can, that they can get? Uh, I'm proposing maybe a three-hour system to, to determine whether somebody should get a diagnosis so we get the numbers down, so we get through this. Um, cost savings analysis, maybe we, we should even just uh, commission it out, I don't know. Uh, but that's a possibility. Early intervention, we should co uh, conduct a cost savings analysis for early intensive behavior analysis based intervention. We know from the research there's ample evidence. I gave a talk here two years ago showing you the evidence. So we know, the government knows the, the evidence for applied behavior analytic uh, interventions and yet that's not the, the preferred route through. Um, we sh it should be made available in the statutory sector or at least it should be outsourced properly. We should ensure that staff training at international best practice interventions is available. We have two master's courses at the universities in applied behavior analysis, and yet we seem to be ignored. We, we've, um, we're just coming back from the Czech Republic where they're just setting up such a course, and we're going over there to teach them because th that's what they want. We have the people here on the ground to teach that. We should be using it. And I think there should be a signature project for early intensive ABA-based intervention funded by the government so that we can actually see it for ourselves. Um, we should monitor edu uh, educational attendance, entertainment and pastoral care of children with autism, of course, across schools. Ensure that staff training is to the highest level of international uh, best practice, not just two hours. Two hours does not train you to, de to, deal with, uh, to help a child with autism. It really doesn't. It, it helps with the autism awareness, and we've seen that, but it doesn't train you to work with kids with autism. Uh, further higher education, we should continue to monitor. And again, that the staff is trained, we should make sure that the staff is trained where appropriate. Employment, uh, we should of course monitor the employment rates. Uh, you know, at the moment we don't know. We, we were suggesting that we should have the uh, question about autism in the labour survey, but that hasn't, that hasn't uh, happened yet, but hopefully. Um, we should ensure that employers and employees are getting training in autism. Um, importantly, we should, we should monitor the employment rates of uh, of parents and ensure that, that the other uh, points are in place. Um, housing, future planning, of course, that's another whole big talk. We can go into that. In, uh, I don't think I'm, I'm running out of time here to talk about that today too much. But just my last slide, if we did all of that, I think we could actually tip the scales in favor of people coming out of poverty uh, and into inclusion. We could have autism awareness, you know, focus on that. We're already doing quite well. Staff training, a huge amount of work to be done. Early diagnosis, early intervention, quite a lot of work to be done. But it's a question, like, like they do in America, but invest early, save later. But that's a difficult one because you know, it's different departments, who's doing the saving, who's doing the spending. School inclusion, post-secondary, employment and housing. So we have, we have our agenda for what is actually needed for these children. And we have now got, through the base study, we have a baseline of those data. And as I said, the reports are uh, all available. There are five reports, all about 120, 150 to 200 pages long, so you have plenty of reading, and they'll be linked to the web page. So thank you very much.